So good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, this is a joint committee meeting with the House Agricultural Committee and the Senate uh, Agricultural Committee. Uh, we're going to be uh, hearing from uh, Commissioner um, Michael Pishak in regards to a, a dairy uh, price regulation assessments uh, this morning. Um, before we get started, uh, I'd like to have our committee introduce themselves and the House Committee. It'll take a minute, but it I think it'd be good so you folks will know at least uh, who's on the committee. Uh, I'm Bobby Starr and I chair the Senate committee. Chris? Chris Pearson, uh, Senator from Chittenden County. Anthony Polina, Senate Ag, representing Washington County. Ryan Collimore from <laughs> Rutland County. Corey Parent from Franklin County and represent Alberg as well. Carolyn? Uh, Representative Carolyn Partridge. I chair the House Agriculture and Forestry Committee. I represent the towns of Athens, Brookline, Grafton, part of North Westminster, all of Rockingham and my hometown of Wyndham. And uh, I'll let Rodney introduce himself. Rodney Graham, I represent Williamstown, Washington, Orange, Grant, Berkshire, and Chelsea. Thanks, Rodney. And we'll go to Tom, who is ranking member. Thank you. I'm uh, Representative Tom Bach. I represent the towns of Chester, Andover, Baltimore, and North Springfield. And we'll go to Terry Norris, who's our clerk. Uh, Terry Norris, I represent the Addison Rutland District, towns of Benson, Orwell, Shoreham, and Whiting. Thanks, Terry. And now Vicki Strong. Good morning. I'm Representative Vicki Strong from Albany, and I represent Orleans Caledonia One. Thanks, Vicki. Uh, now we'll go to John O'Brien. Thank you, Carolyn. I'm Representative John O'Brien. I represent Royalton and my hometown of Tunbridge. Thank you, John. Now we're going to have our two new members. We're so delighted to have them. The first one is a face I'm sure you'll recognize, and that is Henry Pearl. Henry, go ahead. Hi there, Henry Pearl. I represent Danville, Peachum, and Cabot. Thank you, Henry. And um, our another new member who is also a farmer, uh, Heather Supernot. Would you want to go ahead? Hi all, Heather Supernot. I represent Barnard, Pomfret, Queechy, and West Hartford. Thank you. That is us. Yeah, well, thank you, uh, Carolyn. And um, again, welcome to everyone. Um, I'd just like to start out by saying that uh, what got us here today was uh, last session, uh, we spent quite a lot of time uh, dealing, with, um, dealing with milk pricing. And we were at that point in time and throughout the year, of course, we lost quite a few farms. But we, we did uh, get a report from Roger Albee and Dan Smith, who had been working on putting together a, a milk study report uh, for golly two or three years. And <clears throat> we found from that that uh, there is some problems with the way our milk is priced. And, uh, but we, we as a committee um, really needed to learn more in regards to if, you know, what is the problem? Uh, how could we do our milk pricing differently um, so that we could maybe have a Vermont state uh, milk order? Uh, and we, we sort of came to the conclusion that we needed somebody with the expertise and pricing of other commodities with a fresh uh, group of people with eye, a different, looking at this from a different perspective and um, looking at the financial regulations department, thinking that they cover insurance companies and 
in banks and a host of regulated industries here in Vermont and, and the pricing, we uh, called upon Commissioner Pishak to see if he would be willing and interested in proceeding with our, with our request. And we were uh, thrilled that, uh, that he agreed to do this for us. And, and we kind of gave him a, a few directions, but uh, said, hey, you're on, you're on your own. Um, see what you can figure out from a regulatory point of view and, and uh, you know, come back with, a, with your findings and a report. And uh, I must say, <laughs> Um, from my perspective, they, they did a very thorough and in-depth uh, review, and it turned out to be a, a, like a 44-page document. So um, with, um, with that, I'd like to introduce uh, the commissioner of our Department of Financial Regulations, uh, Michael Pishak. Welcome, Michael. Well, um, thank you very much, uh, Chair Starr. It's my pleasure to be here um, with you. And thank you very much for that kind introduction uh, as well. Um, I want to introduce, before we begin, Jill Rickard, who's our Director of Policy. Um, and Jill uh, will help me this morning um, as she was the lead author on the study. And I'll just concur, um, Chair Starr, with your assessment that you know, Jill did. Jill and her team, and and all of those outside stakeholders and experts that we um, called on and, and asked for their perspective and expertise, all did an excellent job, um, and did so in a somewhat condensed time frame, and did so um, during a period of time when there were a lot of um, a lot of different you know fires to be put out, if you will, uh, and our department was handling a number of those. So, really want to thank Jill and and her team and her work um, for the study. I think. You know, Jill had to become expert in, in this area, and it is a challenging area, as you all know, um, to get your hands around and to understand um, the uh, the background and and uh, the technicalities and, and whatnot. And um, you know, think that she did an excellent job with that. So, you know, the the report asked us. You know, I'll share my screen here in a minute um, and let uh, Jill run through a slide deck that we have that sort of goes through in detail the report and talks about um, some of our findings and talks about some of the um, benefits, some of the advantages, some of the, some of the downsides, some of the uh, negatives about some of the different approaches that I think are available to Vermont. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, what I'll say broadly is that there wasn't a clear, um, there wasn't a clear, easy, definitive option that was um, easy for us to point to and say, you know, this is the right answer. This is the approach that will solve the challenges the industry is facing. And, uh, you know, and I think um, I think everyone on the committees can certainly appreciate that because you've been dealing with these issues for some time and, and they don't, you know, they're difficult. And I'm sure you all would have, um, you know, found that easy answer if that easy answer existed. But what we thought was would be the most helpful for us in, in relation to this report was to identify those different policy options talk about whether or not they're possible, whether they're legally possible, whether they're feasible, what the pros and the cons are to those approaches as well. And then um, hopefully that advances your policy discussion and your policy decisions that you have to make about um, different choices and, and different options. So the, the first charge under the study was an evaluation of the long-term sustainability of dairy farming in Vermont. And I'll just say, you know, we were, pleased to do this study in part because we know how um, important and cherished the dairy industry has been for generations in Vermont and will continue to be for generations in Vermont. And it was part of what attracted me to have our team look into this because we know just how critical this issue is. And when we look at the sustainability of the industry, you know, you certainly see that small Vermont farms um, you know, the numbers are, are decreasing. There are fewer and fewer small Vermont farms. Uh, they're consolidating into larger farms for Vermont, you know, on Vermont scale large. 
And um, that certainly speaks to the fact that the smaller farmers in Vermont are having some challenges when it comes to being able to remain independent, being able to remain um, you know, on their own and being able to do that uh, for a price that makes it worth them doing that. So certainly there are challenges from that segment of the industry, but then at the other end of the spectrum for the larger farmers, you know, what we found is that there are still pricing issues when it comes to what they're able to get for their product. And of course, it doesn't take, um, you know, an MBA to determine that if you're creating a product and you're not getting a price that covers that product, that over time, that's going to become a really challenging issue. And it can be an issue even in the short term as well, depending on circumstances. So, you know, um, we also acknowledge that it's not something unique to Vermont. You know, it's something that's happening across the dairy industry in the country, this consolidation. And it's not something unique to the dairy industry either. Consolidation is happening in, in so many different industries and segments. Um, we see it in financial services where you're seeing fewer and fewer small banks and credit unions in Vermont uh, and across the country, smaller, you know, less and less community banks and more and more mega banks. And, and they're doing that for the same reasons that you see um, dairy farms uh, becoming larger and larger. It's for the economies of scale, for their ability to leverage, um, you know, their size to get uh, better uh, technology, better pricing, better operations. Um, so it's not unique to the industry, but certainly we talk about those challenges that are, that are facing the industry. And then, as I said, in terms of the recommendation, in terms of the, you know, recommendations for revising uh, the dairy pricing and other market regulations in the state, um, what we provided in the study were a, a number of different options that could be um, pursued with the, um, with the um, ideas about what are the benefits of taking that option? What are the detriments of taking that option? And again, leaving that sort of policy decision up to the committee. But I think this is probably the appropriate time to share the PowerPoint and let uh, Jill Rickard uh, walk through more of the detail of the study. And of course, we're happy to take any questions that, um, that the committee has at any point uh, or um, at the end as well. We'll, we'll try to keep those at the end, uh, if we can, uh, Commissioner, to not to interrupt you and, and Jill's uh, presentation. That sounds great. And uh, if I can get my technology correct here. Is that showing up for everyone? Yes. So as I mentioned, this was the uh, legislative charge that I just ran through, and I'll... Um, advance ahead here and, and turn it over to um, Director Jill Rickard. Thank you, Mike. Hello, committees. Um, it's nice to be with you today. My name is Jill Rickard. I'm the Director of Policy for DFR. <clears throat> I um, am pleased to provide an overview of our study that did become 44 pages as I actually found myself really enjoying the challenge of uh, learning about and speaking about um, this industry. It took quite a while to become fluent enough to be able to do so for this report, but once that happened, it just become, it became a really interesting field of study. So thank you for the opportunity. Um, our study starts with just a, a sort of overview of the current regulatory and market conditions facing Vermont dairy, um, not only the producers, the farmers, but also the processors. Um, we talk about um, dairy cooperatives, um, a little bit about retail and wholesale pricing. Um, as Commissioner Pichak said, you know, dairy is the is a very important industry in Vermont, as you all know. It's the largest agricultural industry in Vermont, contributing approximately two point two billion dollars um, in economic, sorry, one second, activity per year to the state, um, and it is facing significant challenges, um, mostly because the costs of production tend to exceed the available uh, the available price to producers under the federal milk market order. Um, in addition to that, there is a, a significant amount of volatility in the price available, which makes it difficult to plan in the long term. Um, this has caused a decrease in the number of farms. The Vermont dairy farms, there are 610 today. They've decreased 69% since 1997 and 37% in the last 10 years. Um, 
There is also, as Mike mentioned, been a significant amount of consolidation of farms in line with under industries. There's also been a significant amount of consolidation of processors. Um, this is also true in terms of the dairy co-ops. They have consolidated um, to become more regional in nature, more national in nature. Um, there are two main ones, obviously, as you know, in Vermont, Agrimark and DFR, and those are very large um, regional and national co-ops, whereas perhaps 50 years ago, co-ops would have been uh, more local in nature. Um, one thing, other thing I should mention is that there is a decreased demand for fluid milk across the board and in Vermont, but an increased demand for dairy overall. Um, finally, COVID-19 has really thrown a wrench into things. It's, it's a little bit difficult to take um, 2020 as a sort of the natural progression of things post 2019 because it's been such a strange year, but it's definitely made things very difficult um, this year and also to predict what's to come post pandemic. So the next slide. Bill, can I just mention one thing on COVID-19? Um, you know, what we've seen across the board in our industry, uh, financial industries and higher education and hospital systems, you know, industries that were doing really well prior to the pandemic that were in really strong financial position and had good operations, you know, they have been able to weather the pandemic pretty well. And in some cases, they've come out better, actually. And all of those industries that I just mentioned that were struggling prior to the pandemic, you know, the pandemic really exacerbated their um, challenges. And to some degree, you know, I think you could put dairy, um, the dairy industry into that bucket as well. So the first thing I'll sort of talk about is the federal milk market order. I'm sure everyone on this call is familiar with it, but the but to sort of level set, we looked at the pros and cons of the federal milk market order. Um, in terms of being a, a neutral regulator and calculator, it does serve that function well. It provides for orderly market conditions, um, and it is helping to ensure an adequate fluid milk supply, which is one of its missions. Um, it provides a transparent, publicized minimum price, and it serves a very important audit function um, to ensure that transactions are fair and being conducted um, in the way that they should. Some of the cons are it's, you know, one of its other missions is to improve the income situation of dairy farmers. Um, and it that is a, a mission that it, it, it maybe is struggling um, to serve. Uh, and that's evidenced by the fact that Vermont small farms have increasingly consolidated or not been able to stay profitable um, in the recent past. Um, there are also issues, and this is something that's a bit above our um, you know, level of expertise here, but with the price calculation methodology for the federal milk market order. And this is something we talked to um, some of the co-ops about and some of the other industry experts um, with how the price is calculated and how it's dependent on um, the class one price. And the report sets forth, forth a couple of options that people have suggested to sort of get behind for some changes at the federal level. Um, so our report sets forth not only alternatives to the current system of regulation, but also just some ways we think that um, the legislature could think about supplementing it um, and, and improving it just at the local level. We talk about, of course, changes to the FMMO pricing formulas that I just mentioned. We talk about risk management, um, which is an important part of um, ensuring that farmers can make a good return, but it's not a way of changing the system. There are um, options available in terms of private hedging um, using the derivatives market, forward contracting through dairy co-ops, and also options at the federal government level to manage risk. We talk about state milk marketing orders and provide a legal analysis of whether doing that would be possible in Vermont. And we also um, look at the systems in place in both Maine and Pennsylvania in depth. And I'll talk about the Maine system in a, in a future slide. We talk about 
the regional compact um, that did exist a couple of years ago and whether that would be possible or advisable on a going forward basis. Um, obviously, that depends on um, the cooperation of other member states and action at the federal level that's a little bit out of our hands. We talk about various systems of supply management at the state level, at the national level. Um, again, it does involve congressional action if we were to do something like that, but we do run through the different systems that have been proposed or are in place in different areas. Um, we talk about whether it makes sense to increase focus on organic. Um, and then finally, we spend a lot of time talking about the possibilities for providing support for education, farm management, um, edu uh, sorry, technical assistance, um, innovative solutions, increasing um, brand awareness of Vermont products. And those are, like I said, supplements to the current system that would hopefully help out individual farms and, and to help out things at the local level, but they are not fixes to the system of dairy pricing regulation. So I'll start with just providing an overview of the main state order system and tier program. And we had a couple of conversations with Julie Marie Bickford, who is the head of the main, I believe, dairy producers organization. And she was very helpful in explaining the system and the pros and the cons and how it works and what makes it successful or not in Maine. So the Maine Milk Commission sets minimum prices for producers, wholesalers, and retailers. Um, the producer price is the federal milk market order price, plus a reflective regional, regional premium that is um, adjusted periodically by the commission. <clears throat> However, the minimum prices apply to a, only a small subset, subset of producers because most processors sell more than 25% of their finished products outside of Maine into federal milk market order states. And so the majority of producers actually are receiving pricing under the federal milk marketing order. Um, there are some additional programs that Maine offers that supplement the minimum price scheme um, that appear to be providing some successful or, you know, semi-successful safety nets for Vermont, or sorry, for Maine producers. One is that they offer a quality seal for processors who utilize 100% Maine milk. And this is a way for the state to encourage processors not to source milk from out of state. Um, one of the very large processors does utilize the quality seal um, and they don't actually source any milk from neighboring states. There are some geographical challenges that make Maine a very unique state that's not easily comparable to Vermont. Um, and it's you know being bordered by Canada and the ocean and not several other states like Vermont is um, make it a little bit different from our state in the way that we can source um, and also market our milk and dairy products. Maine also has a 30 day rule um, that requires a processor to give 30 days notice to a producer before it turns off the sourcing of that milk or terminates the agreement to source. And this ensures that a producer can find a home for its milk if the processor is planning to terminate the agreement, the processor has to give that notice to the um, Secretary of Agriculture of Maine. Um, and in connection with the state order pricing, they also have what's known as a tier program. It's the sustainability Dairy Sustainability Program, which makes payments to farmers from the state's general fund when the federal price is lower than the costs of production. Um, the payment depends on a farmer's current level of production for, per year, uh, which starts at zero at the beginning of the calendar year, and then each farm <clears throat> goes through the tiers um, throughout the, the, the year um, and gets higher prices for the first amount of milk, and then the level, the level means a, a lower um, program payment as, they, as their produ production grows. The, even though these payments are made out of the general fund, there is a milk handling fee that's assessed on um, 
the first main entity to touch milk. So whether that's the processor or a wholesaler, if they're sourcing products from outside of Maine or even a retailer. Um, and those handling fees are deposited into the general fund and they're sort of providing partial payments for that tier program, but they don't fund the entire thing. There is a really significant amount of general fund payment that the main government makes every year to the tier program to support the farmers. Um, and even in the face of all of these actions, farms in Maine are still consolidating similarly to the way that they are in Vermont. It does seem to be obviously supporting um, a better price for producers in that state, but it is not preventing small farms from closing. Um, and something else obviously to think about is that the price of milk in Maine for consumers is obviously higher. Next slide. So another thing we looked at are the various supply management programs in place and that have been proposed. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with the Vermont Supply Management Working Group's proposal, um, which supported a, a two-tier growth management system. And then the Dairy Together Group, which is part of the Wisconsin Farmers Union, has proposed a market access fee program. Um, which would set annual production growth limits, but allow a farm to pay a fee to expand production beyond those limits. The fees would then be distributed among farms that choose to limit their production. Um, there was an empirical study that was done that showed some positive impacts to this program if it had been implemented in the 2014 Farm Bill. Um, and those are detailed in the report. Clearly, a supply management program is not something that would be successful at the state level. Um, Montana's system is detailed also in the report. They're the only state that has a state level supply management system. There are some issues with that. Um, if supply management were to be implemented, it would have to be a national action, which obviously requires congressional approval and is somewhat out of Vermont's hands. Um, we would suggest if the legislature is interested in looking at this further to um, do some cost benefit analyses, uh, comparing you know, the, the, the benefits to producers, processors, retailers, consumers, and also the potential drawbacks to such a program. Next slide, Mike. Um, and the last section of our report um, examines some areas where we would suggest that the legislature could consider supporting innovation and in farm management, um, educational and financial support for on-farm technologies, as well as lower cost, lower input production methods. Um, a few things we look at are um, increased support for grazing by farmers and not just organic farmers, but farmers across the board could benefit from grazing. Um, it, could increase price and also lower the costs of inputs such as feed. Um, farm hygiene and milk quality management are ways to boost price by in increasing component quality um, and other quality aspects of milk. Um, there are programs for technical and financial planning as well as on-farm quality management programming at UVM Extension as well as the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. Another way to help farmers with costs would be to reduce transportation costs, which are very high. Um, a way to do that would be to help farmers obtain additional bulk storage and more efficient plate cooling systems. Some programs are available through Efficiency Vermont, um, but those are pretty expensive innovations um, that a lot of farms wouldn't be able to make on their own. Um, the Innovation Council of which, um, oh, excuse me a second, I forgot the name of that. Laura Ginsburg heads, heads it up. Um, has looked into um, increasing the market appeal for Vermont products by um, perhaps helping them re uh, use packaging that's recyclable. So now um, most uh, paper store uh, paper milk packaging is not recyclable because it's lined with plastic um, and cheese 
uh, packaging, of course, is is plastic as well. So they're looking into whether it's possible to switch or source recyclable packaging there, which would obviously give Vermont brands a boost um, for consumers that are interested in buying things in recyclable packaging. And they're also have suggested a brand ambassador to promote um, Vermont brands, not, yeah. not the Vermont brand in general, but specific Vermont brands. And we think that is a good idea as well. So those are a bunch of the things that we have looked at. I, I didn't go into a whole lot of detail about it because the, the report is, as you said, 44 pages and it, it, it does contain a lot of information and analysis. Um, our conclusion is that there are no easy fixes to the problem, unfortunately. Um, we are happy to work further with the committee, but of course the dairy stakeholders are the ones who really know this industry, the, the farmers themselves, the industry groups, the co-ops, the Agency of Agriculture um, should all weigh in on whatever steps that the legislature looks at. Um, we suggest a number of cost benefit analysis, as I mentioned, and um, we would suggest that action at the federal level um, could be supported through these various tr trade organizations and co-ops, which I think now the co-ops are leading an effort to um, suggest changes to the, the pricing methodology in the federal milk market order. And of course, um, we suggest um, consideration of support for on-farm management and innovations. Yeah, uh, thank you, Jill. Um, so we're back to the full screen. Uh, Michael, did you have anything to add to Jill's uh, report? No, I, I think just again, wanted to thank um, Jill and thank her for that summary. I think she hit on all the high points. There's a lot more detail in the report, both on the points that Jill hit on and then additionally some other um, you know, areas of discussion as well, but wanted to really highlight the things that we thought were the most relevant to the committee and the things that committee would have the most interest in and potentially have the most questions about. Yeah, <clears throat> um, so I guess we'll, we're, um, we'll take uh, any questions from committee members. Um, I'm wondering, um, Michael or Jill, um, if you, if somewhere in your report, I think I figured out or read that 62% of our, our milk basically is utilized here in Vermont, uh, which is like night and day from what it used to be uh, 20 and 30 years ago. And I'm wondering if, if, you, if you looked at that, uh, because what we did in the legislature and throughout the industry is... Um, we promoted uh, value added and, you know, that's the way to go. And you're go we're gonna make a lot of money from the products and then we'll divide the money up. And well, we did go ahead and create a lot of products, Cabot Cheese, Ben and Jerry's, uh, the, the uh, factory down in, in Brattleboro all value added and utilizing a lot of our milk, but it never seems to trickle down. And so I'm wondering, did you look at that at all about the, the volume and where it goes and whether or not uh, somehow we should be able to tap into uh, the value added products or the milk that goes into value added products? We did look at where the milk goes, um, and you're right, the, we, there's not a lot of fluid processing in the state. It's um, going to cheese and to the yogurt plant and, and um, some, some other things as well, um, but mostly those two. Tapping into the value add in terms of, I, I guess I'm just not following how to... Well, what I was thinking is, or what I'm, the question is, is there a way that we could put a, some kind of a surcharge or 
some kind of a, a pricing mechanism on these value added products, which <clears throat> would generate money and that money could revert back to the, the farmer because the way, as you know, the way the federal milk marketing order works, um, class one is the highest and highest price milk. And then you work your way down to where this other milk is not worth very much or not as much. And at the same point in time, there's a big demand for the cheeses and the yogurts and the Ben and Jerry's ice creams and, and all that. But yet that's where our milk's going, but yet we aren't uh, reaping any of the the bennies, you know, it's it's amazing to me that a pint of Ben and Jerry's ice cream cost as much as a gallon of milk, and or you get a little pint of ice cream and you pay four dollars and something for it, and you go to the stores on certain days and you can buy a gallon of milk for you know three ninety nine and. It, uh, there seems to be a lot of slippage there on, on the value. Yeah, we, I agreed. And one of the things we talk about is, you know, that is something that a number of stakeholders are pushing for to change in the federal milk market order pricing methodology. Yeah, um, the, yeah the, that, is, that is something that a number of people mentioned that they're working toward. Um, if in terms of doing that at the state level, I mean, Maine controls not only producer prices, but also, you know, the minimum wholesale and retail prices. And so obviously if you're talking about increasing retail prices for certain of those products, then that could flow back to the producer, but they, in terms of the system we have now, I think those changes would be have to be done at the federal level. Yeah. Um, hey, Jill. If, or Senator, if I just, and Jill could correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I think this gets into the, you know, into, into the fact that geography helps Maine and that, you know, maybe there's not a lot of alternatives to um, milk coming from Maine for those that are doing the processing in their state where we wouldn't necessarily have that geographic benefit. And, and if we, if there were too many restrict, you know, if the price was, was, you know, you just have to be mindful with the prices and what the restrictions are and, and would individuals, would companies then source their milk from other places other than Vermont um, and how you would control for that. Not that it couldn't be done, but I think that's the consideration, a consideration, Jill, and something unique, unfortunately, to Vermont that Maine doesn't have to contend with as much. Yeah. <clears throat> the, uh, so, you know, we've been doing the, the problem that we, I think we're facing is that we've been doing the same old, same old, and you know, the same old worked pretty good until the federal order was revamped uh, back uh, uh, 10, 15 years ago. And, and uh, you know, it's kind of gone south on us, uh, keeping up with the cost of everything. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we've got a long ways to go and, and we keep bumping into, you know, roadblocks as we move uh, forward. Um, and uh, we always, well, you can't do this because that's in the federal order or you can't do this because it's in, you know, you got to go to Washington and uh, you know, I think uh, Jill mentioned a dairy compact well, you know, it, it took us nine years, I think it was, to get get that thing put together and and passed. And some of us in the room haven't got nine more years to work on a project to get passed, uh, including myself. Um, so you know, it it, um, it it behooves me that that we've got this issue and, and we can't seem to find a, a solution. Uh, I know you've got some good recommends, uh, supply management, supply control. Uh, 
well, we're under that system now, but I don't see where it's benefiting our our dairy producers. Uh, you know, if they were cut fifteen uh, percent, so on the eighty-five percent, they were getting an extra buck a hundred or something. You'd say, well, by golly, we finally got it figured out, but um, that isn't the way the system. Not that we put it together, it was put together by, of course, a milk handler. And uh, so it benefits, uh, you know, the processing and the handlers, not the dairy farmers that we're concerned about. Um, are there questions from any of the committee uh, members? Uh, that, you know, if you raise your hand, I think. Uh, either I or Linda will see you. Um, if... Senator Starr, sorry, yes. can I mention one more thing? Oof. Yes. So the, the one thing I wanted to mention that about the premium on the on the dairy products, or sorry, the processed products, is it, we are a little more similar to Pennsylvania in terms of their state market order in terms of our geography. The two things I would mention there are one is that their milk is some of the highest in, priced in the country. So there's this balance between what consumers are can or are willing to pay and how that impacts Vermonters um, if you were to do the federal milk market order. And then the other thing that I found interesting is that Doug Eberly, who's the head of the Pennsylvania Milk Commission, mentioned that they don't set premiums for cheese and other processed products because there is a more national market for those. Um, and so mandating a premium for Pennsylvania for, for non-fluid milk um, would make their products less competitive in the, in the national market. So that's not something else to think about. Yeah, we bump up against that, uh, you know, all the time. Um, the, um, so, um, you know, what, what did you find uh, where we could, uh, you know, advance some type of a, an updated, uh, state pricing system? Uh, did you uh, come across anything that that we possibly could do to, to do that? <laughs> well, I think we, we, our conclusion is that I don't, if, if structured correctly, we don't believe there are any legal impediments to doing so. It's a matter of what the practical issues are and whether the cost benefit analysis ultimately tells us that it's a good idea for Vermont. And, and in that way, I think we're not very similar to Maine. We're more similar to Pennsylvania in terms of our geography, not necessarily in our farm size and volume, but um, in a number of other ways. So it's interesting to look at Pennsylvania in that way. Um, so a lot of the other states that have state market orders are very different from Vermont as well. So it's hard to compare. Yeah. Yeah, geographically, we, you know, across the bridge into New York, there's plenty of milk that, that already seems to find its way into Vermont and uh, dilutes our, you know, our poundage. Uh, you know, because if you look at, if you look at what is bottled, and what goes into ice cream and cheese and yogurt and powder, it adds up to way more than our production. Um, so, you know, we are, we are for some reason importing uh, milk into, into Vermont uh, from somewhere. Um, and I don't know if we've ever looked into that, um, um, so. Um, so any other questions uh, from folks? If Carolyn, did you have any house members that had a question? Uh, Bobby, I'm not seeing any little blue hands. Um, uh, if anybody has a question, this is your opportunity. John O'Brien has a question. Okay, yep. John, go ahead. Thank you. Um, Jill, I just wondered, if there was any analysis of um, of just our so the number of of farms uh, versus the the pricing of milk, so if we have six hundred dairy farms approximately in Vermont, um, 
and we'd rather keep 600 dairy farms in Vermont than have the same number of cows with 10 dairy farms in Vermont. So if there's a community value to farms, um, did you look at, at somehow state pricing or perhaps even federal pricing of, of a dairy, dairy farms at, at scale? So for example, if Vermont said, uh, the first 100 cows you milk, you're gonna get $5, 100 more, um, and have maybe a graduated pricing like that. And, and also how did you look at, at places like France and Switzerland where there, there are certain regions where that sort of scale farming works and, and how much it costs to, to keep those farms going. I didn't know if we could come up with a price that may be prohibitive, but sort of work backwards from that, like how much if Vermont subsidized a certain amount of milk, how much would that cost? Um, thank you, Representative. That, that is not a level of analysis, a detail of analysis we actually were able to do. And I did not expand our analysis to European countries. They have a, you know, a vastly different system of regulation, as you know. So I, I sort of tried to stay out of that realm <laughs> for this particular report. But that's something that if you're interested in us doing, we could probably in, engaged with a firm that could help us do some sort of study on potential pricing. Terry Norris has a question. Yeah. Uh, I've just uh, probably a lot of it's just rumor maybe, but uh, maybe you can answer some of those questions that are, that are rumors, but uh, when I was on the Milk Commission, we talked about uh, supply management and and Agrimark and and DFA both uh, implemented uh, some uh, restrictions. And if I'm not, uh, I could be incorrect, but I think uh, Agrimark has lifted those, and DFA is still have the same uh, restrictions. And I'm just wondering if uh, you think that DFA being a more national co-op, uh, is, is that a problem considering they could uh, bring their milk from the Midwest here uh, cheaper than they could pay the farmers in Vermont to produce it? Just uh, curious. Um, I, I wasn't even, I, sorry, I wasn't aware that Agrimark had lifted theirs at the time that we submitted the report. I think that was still in place. Um, and I'm not sure how to answer that question, unfortunately. Yeah. It's a little. The, I think Agrimark is still on to some degree. And, um, um, uh, I know the, the 15% that DFA did impose uh, the reduction, I believe, I do, I know that's still in play, um, but um, you know, it's strange. It makes me wonder, we got a 15% reduction from DFA, but it's only part way across the country. And if we're importing milk from out of state um, to keep our, uh, our utilization going in, in the cheese business and the ice cream business and the yogurt business, why, you know, why don't, D, why doesn't DFA find a home for that milk uh, out there and, and keep our milk for our own um, industries and not, not uh, penalize us with a 15% reduction in uh, production on our farms. Um, but anyways, uh, those are all issues that I guess are gonna need uh, more, more uh, review and, and study. If, if there are no other questions for committee members, um, if any of the guests that are on uh, would like to have something to say, if you'd raise your hand uh, Linda will make sure that you get unmuted and uh, we'll uh, let you on. Senator Starr, this is Jackie Folsom from the Vermont Farm Bureau. Uh, 
I have no internet <laughs> today, so I'm on the phone with you all. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you very much for um, asking the Department of Financial Regulation to uh, work on this report. And as those of us who've been around the dairy industry for a while know, it is not an easy thing to do. Vermont Farm Bureau is policy driven. And so um, I just like to tell you that in regards to their recommendations, we support a national all in supply management program. And we have been working with Bobby Wilson at the Wisconsin Farmers Union as a result of the dairy summit that was held a couple years ago. We were on track to be um, engaging with all sorts of legislators across the country uh, prior to COVID and trying to work up a supply management program into the next farm bill. As I recall, Secretary Purdue at the time from USDA said he would not support that, but that didn't stop us. What did stop us was COVID. Um, and we don't know, I haven't heard what uh, incoming Secretary Vilsack has to say about supply management and um, we'll probably be working backwards on that. We do support modernization of the federal milk marketing system uh, and um, the need to support regional production for food security. And we also have a longstanding line of support for a state, national, and industry-supported long-term countercyclical program, AKA the Compact. Um, we would hope, um, as a farm organization that represents all types and kinds and sizes of farming, um, we would not focus on organic or grazing um, as a way to solve this situation because we believe that every farmer has the, the uh, needs the ability to, to figure out what works best on their farm. But we would support more and continue technical support to farmers. I think we, you've heard in both the House and Senate Ag Committee testimony from um, the folks, um, BHCB and UVM Extension, who have discovered while helping farmers complete their forms for the CARES money that a lot of our folks need help in not only broadband access, but in the ability to um, do record keeping and that sort of thing, and it is a need. And uh, finally, I'll just uh, notice that someone mentioned Efficiency Vermont. Um, farmers are paying an inordinate amount of money to um, Efficiency Vermont as the charge on their electric bill, and many of them have already taken advantage of all the programs that they have offered. And we would just really like to see Efficiency Vermont step up um, and look at more programs that can benefit farmers directly in regards to energy efficiency. And we'd be glad to work with any number of farmers to help them figure that out. I'm sure we could have a robust conversation on what their needs are and what the next steps could be with Efficiency Vermont, and I'd love to have that conversation. Um, so thank you very much, and that's where uh, Farm Bureau is today. Yeah, and, and Jackie, uh, moving forward, if uh, if you, you know, if you have some recommends where we can uh, bring in Efficiency Vermont and recommend certain updates and and policies and practices, uh, we'd be glad to uh, work on that with with you and the rest of the, you know, anybody that wants to help out is great. Uh, Thank you very much. Are there any other questions from any other uh, folks? Yes, uh, Rob. Linda, could you unmute Rob Wheeler? Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, so, so I would just like to ask the question of the department if uh, they looked into it at all, and maybe it wasn't part of your charge. Um, or if you studied it all, uh, providing help, financial assistance for those companies with Vermont dairy brands to expand markets. That is a, uh, I can tell you from serving on the Agrimark Board of Directors, that is a huge sum of money to break into a new market. And, and, and it's not just a one and done sort of thing. You have to back it up. You have to go back year after year and keep supporting that brand in order to provide that kind of growth, that meaningful growth that we need to continue um, converting commodity pounds to value added pounds. We've done a really nice job of that. And I know uh, um, Chairman Starr mentioned earlier, you know, why is that difficult for that money to trickle back down to the farmers? 
And while I don't have the exact figure in front of me, I can share with you that uh, our cooperative routinely in the last several years um, pays, um, pays well above what I would say was well above per hundred weight, the Boston blend price to its members, not just uh, the Vermont members, but all the members of the co-op receive that. And, and that is directly attributed to our conversion of commodity pounds to value added branded Cabot products. But it costs a lot of money to support that brand and, and, and to advance that into other areas of the country. We're pretty well known here in our backyard. We do a really nice job, but the further away you get, the more, the more competition there is and, and just the more more money it takes to support that brand and, and have any meaningful growth. And, and I'm wondering if you folks at all looked into helping those branded companies um, with uh, market access and supporting market. Thanks. Uh, uh, Rob, thanks a lot for um, letting us know that you, you folks at Agrimart are paying above uh, the federal milk market order price. I, I hadn't heard that uh, from any of my farmers um, uh, in the near, in the, you know, that used to be they'd get a 25th check or, or something. And uh, so that, that's good news. And uh, as far as helping uh, to, helping uh, to produce and, and promote and update on Vermont products. Um, and didn't, didn't Cabot cheese take Vermont off the label or something uh, the, off the cheese label or something? Is that, am I wrong on that, Rob, or not? There, there are areas and there are products because they're not made in Vermont. Like we have a plant in, uh, in Chattagay, New York, obviously, that uh, we cannot put those products. No. May not be able to have a Vermont branded, uh, they may not say Vermont on them. And, and we found as we do try to enter new markets, uh, believe it or not, as well as much as we love that Vermont brand, it doesn't always resonate in other parts of the country like it does here in our backyard. No, I'll be darned. But, yeah. So you learn something every day. <laughs> um, so is there uh, other questions, concerns, uh, issues? Eh? So, uh, Marie? Um, well, why don't we get Jill back on if she's got a comment, and then we'll go to Marie. Thank you, Senator. Um, and thank you for the question. We, we, the extent that we looked at helping brands like Cabot enter new markets um, and other, you know, smaller Vermont brands and large Vermont brands. We looked at the 2020 Vermont Dairy Marketing Assessment actually proposed a state government position for a brand ambassador and not a sort of overall Vermont brand ambassador, but somebody that would have the specific role of helping Vermont brands market themselves effectively in other states. Um, and that's something we thought was was really interesting. Obviously, it requires the funding to do that. Um, but but that proposal was made in the Vermont Dairy Marketing Assessment this past year. Yeah, uh, thanks, Jill. Uh, Marie? Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? This is a new system in the barn here. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay, so something really hit me, Jill, when you were talking, um, you know, about the reasons that um, we've lost farms, so many farms, and then you also compared it to Maine, who pays better. Um, there's this assumption that we have that the number of farms is dwindling because of price only. And I'm wondering if we really looked at that, if that's why farms are going out, because I know I live on 22A. And 30 years ago, it was farm after farm after farm between Fairhaven and Virginia. Yeah. And, you know, our family stayed farming and we've, uh, we've acquired several of those, like maybe nine, I don't know, more. And every single one of them, they were just retiring. They aged out. Yeah. <laughs> so that, no one said, oh, I'm sick of the price of milk. I'm, you know, and they're young and they're quitting. They had had a full life and their farm was their retirement. So that just hit me. That's just the thought. But really, um, as dairy farmers today, I think that our value here in the Northeast, we're realizing is going way beyond just the milk that leaves the driveway. 
I mean, we're looking at a world where places we're depending on for food are going dry or they're not going to be able to provide what we have. And here in Vermont, we have opportunities to feed ourselves. And really, we're only feeding this region. We only make 50% of our own dairy for this region. And, you know, if we look at this region as a whole, Vermont's pretty small. So I think, you know, a lot of um, what we're doing is in the innovation, is in the other things that we provide to society. And it's like, you know, cleaning the water, making sure, you know, we adopt all the conservation practices that will actually improve our environment. And, you know, you folks, Senator Starr, are on this, you know, with the payment for ecosystem benefits or whatever it is we call it these days, understanding that value that we have. And, you know, like on our farm, we're starting to look at different kinds of products like phosphorus. Instead of importing phosphorus, we're taking it out of the manure and recycling it. And we'd like to package it and further sell it. I mean, there's so many opportunities beyond just the milk. So that, those are two yeah. topics. And we're working on carbon credits that uh, are produced on farms to help that way. I mean, we've got a lot going for us, um, but have you ever figured out, Marie, why people pay four dollars and I have Ben and Jerry's pint of ice cream, but they won't pay six dollars for a gallon of milk. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it makes you wonder, doesn't it? Well, all our growth has been not in fluid milk. So, you know, I'm a cheese farmer. I'm a Cabot farmer. And I know that people love the cheese because during lockdown, yeah. we increased our retail sales by 20 percent. So yeah. that, you know, we're in those other, and then we just added some new products that are really, really popular. So I think it's about, you know, building trust in your community so that people can see you, can see us, you know, anyone buying a cabinet product can get online and see those, all farmers in Vermont. I really understand this today that, you know, this connection, this, this is what's going to make us stand above others in the country. I mean, Vermont farmers are way above understanding our societal role. Yes, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, Representative gonna... Pearl has a question. Yes. Representative, go ahead. Hi there. Yeah, I just wanted to build on what Marie said. I was having some similar thoughts and it's kind of a newbie uh, question because I don't know how you guys have done a lot of work over the years on this, but um, I just wondered if, if we took a step back and thought about the, the real question here of what we're trying to accomplish and if that's to increase pay price or if it's to increase the number of farms or save the farms that we have here, because those are all very, very different questions. And, and to add on to that, I mean, the thought of how much you would have to increase the pay price to make it so it's actually a viable business for people to restart and re-enter the market is probably prohibitive. And I mean, I just I just wonder what the what the true if if we've really addressed the main question, which is which is what do we want? What does Vermont want? And um and I I, I just was had some concerns on that and if, if anybody could elaborate that on. Well, uh, Henry, uh, is it Henry? Yes. Yeah. Um, 20, I bet it was 20 years ago. I forgot the date, but we, we, the compact was mentioned in Jill's uh, report and brought up and uh, 20 years ago or more, we put that together. Bob Gray is on uh, on with us today that uh, worked a lot on that in Washington. But way back, way back then, uh, we had a pay price to dairy farmers of $16.74. The um, the price was regulated. It was set by a board uh, of people uh, that dealt with this. And, you know, my phone stopped ringing. I was like that Maytag repairman ad that you used to see on TV, sitting there scratching his head because he didn't have anything to do. The processors were happy. The farmers were happy. Consumers were happy and everything worked good. Uh, and the, 
both Agrimar and St. Albans Co-ops were big supporters of getting that going and helping getting that going. And, um, you know, it worked well, but for some reason in Washington, we, we uh, couldn't get it ratified the second time uh, to be uh, renewed. But so that was, it was $16 in something 20 odd years ago for the price of milk. Well, we all know that how prices have gone for, for tractors and seed and fertilizers and buildings and everything. And, you know, the price should be up around $20, $21 a hundred weight to, and everybody should be able to afford that. And, um, but anyways, um, that's a little history lesson on, on what we can afford, but it would be nice if our, if our farmers could feel like they're making money and uh, being able to buy and, and utilize the equipment that they need and, and do the practices now that we're requiring done on farms uh, for clean water and phosphorus removal and, and all those things. But anyways, um, let's get on. Is there someone else with a, with a question? Or... John Roberts has a question. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome, I, John. Hi, Senator Starr and everybody else. Um, just very quickly, I'm the executive director these days of a farmer advocacy group based in Middlebury. We have nearly 100 farmer members from some of the very biggest farms in the state down to a beekeeper. Um, just some quick comments. I can. Uh, Jill's comment about looking into the European pricing system. I have a little knowledge about that, um, mainly English knowledge. Uh, Co-ops as we have them are illegal over there. Um, they, they do have some co-ops, but they're quite different. Um, the milk pricing is very, very strongly linked to supermarkets and and they sort of dictate what the base milk price is, but their milk price also has a, a stronger link to the cost of production than ours does. And um, so, that, so that's something that might be worth looking at. Um, another comment is I really wanna commend this report. Um, I am full of admiration as to how um, <clears throat> uh, Commissioner Pichak and his, his staff um, wrote a very even-handed, um, very balanced report um, and basically emphasized how complicated the whole business is. Um, the other comment is, you know, for a time, many of you know, I worked for the Agency of Ag. And while I did that, I had an opportunity to visit many, many farms in this state from the northern border all the way down um, to the south. Um, and it was always interesting to see the vastly different management styles and capabilities that were on farms. And I would really think that we need to spend much more money, time, effort in helping our farmers understand the business of being a farmer. Um, I think, I, I, sadly, there are probably many, many farmers who if you walked onto their farm and said, what does it cost you to make 100 pounds of milk? They actually couldn't tell you um, accurately. And I think that is something that should be encouraged. Um, I've, you know, I was a dairy farmer for 40 years um, and have worried about this um, system for all of that time. And one of my main worries was how do we, if we, if we do something different to everybody else, how do we protect the borders of Vermont so we don't get swamped 
with cheaper milk, which we saw when, you know, the compact uh, didn't or failed eventually, it was because of pressure, legal, political, and commercial from outside the state. Um, how we do that. And I don't think secession is a reality. Um, so um, those are just, you know, my comments. Uh, I look forward to working with you, both the House and Senate Ag. Um, oh, one last comment is for at least the next two years, we have two of the most powerful senators uh, come from Vermont. And, you know, they control the money the money um, committees in the Senate. I hope that we can uh, utilize that power if we want to change the milk marketing order, um, which clearly um, is maybe needs a total rethink. We saw with the producer price differential going haywire this last summer and reacting negatively for farmers uh, that that is something that we really need to look at. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, thank you, John. <clears throat> um, Amanda St. Pierre is next. Amanda. Thank you, Senator, and thank you everybody um, on both committees and the study is very interesting. Um, I had a couple points piggybacking on some of the other comments, so this might not be in the order I've been taking notes, but um, I do want to um, talk a little bit about the aging population and lack of farm transition opportunities. And I do think that's something that the state could absolutely help um, in. And I think some of it begins in reinvesting in our vocational programs um, and re-energizing some of that work. Um, COVID has been a very challenging time across education and certainly in our state colleges. And I know that's that's really something that needs to be addressed. And I think um, retraining people to work in uh, with their hands and outside and on the land and um, that progression needs to happen to keep our 600 dairy farms um, there. Um, and I think some of the transitions we are seeing is due to that. Um, I also think, um, that there could be resources, the state and through federal monies to help uh, Vermont farmers to implement the practices which mean so much to Vermonters. And I think I agree with Marie that they have to be science-based and they have to have a proven effect on the environment. I think it can't just be a social policy driven, it really has to be science driven. Um, and there is a lot of science out there and there are a lot of practices that farmers would be excited to implement in technology but they just don't have the resources. So I think that would be something the state could help. And by doing that, we can lead in some of these new markets that we'll be developing. Um, you know, we're, we're involved on our farm. We're um, enrolled in a California market for our digester, which is, you know, when they first proposed it, it it's not something that dairy farmers really think about, but you know, we're, we're learning all of this and the technology and advancements um, I think we just need some assistance in getting more farms involved with those practices. I think also the state um, can look at, and I'm interested in, in Jill's um, perspective on cost of production and how it varied from the states you looked at. And was there a deep dive in there? Could there be a deep dive? How does the cost of production vary from state to state? Understanding geography would have a part, but what else plays into that? The cost of implementing policies, um, the cost of labor, the cost of insurances state to state, there's a lot in that. And so most farms today, we're dealing with the margins. You know, we're dealing with the margins and we are insuring our milk and that's adding to our cost of production, but that's not to make money, but that's to minimize our loss. And especially during COVID, a lot of farms got introduced to that and will be he heavily investing in the next couple of years as we try to pull out and see what's going to happen to our exports. So I guess, A, did you, did you do a deep dive? And B, is that possible to do a deep dive? And I think the last part I would like to say is I was really excited about the brand ambassador idea. Um, I think that's great. And I think if you tied that with um, some supports for a Vermont Dairy Innovation Center, where 
you know, small farmers can go in with some ideas on how to market something specific to their dairy. And we have um, a couple people on the call who do their own sales from their farm. You know, they could add to their product line um, and it seems to be working for them. And I would like to just see if that's something more perhaps the state could invest in and, and the next steps and would be excited to continue that conversation on another date. I'd like to thank yeah. everybody for their time this morning. Yeah, thank you, Amanda. Jill, did you have any comments and and with uh, that you'd like to give? Sure, thank you. Um, a couple of things. First of all, the, the, the Northeast Dairy Innovation Center is, um, it, you know, it's not Vermont specific, but it's regional specific. And that is being headed up by someone at our Agency of Agriculture, Laura Ginsberg, or she's part of the leadership on that. Um, they're doing some really great research um, in terms of, you know, how to increase value for Vermont farms, such as you know, is it possible to help Vermont farms get into more of the recyclable packaging? And would that put us at an advantage in terms of our marketing as compared to other states? Um, they're also looking to a number of on-farm technologies and how to help support um, it, farms financially in that aspect. And they've gotten some federal grant money, which is great. So I just wanted to plug that. Um, second, um, we absolutely took into account and mentioned in our report the generational challenges of just not having the next generation of dairy farmers to step up and take over and that is driving a lot of the consolidation. I also on the other hand in the report mentioned that young people who want to get into farming who don't necessarily have the family um, history in farming are challenged by the cost of land and the capital cost to get started in the industry. And that is something else that's, I think, probably prohibiting a lot of young people who would want to get started in, you know, the, the, the new sort of trendy cheese, artisanal cheese and artisanal butter that's sort of taking over. There are a lot of people that um, just can't get there because the capital costs are too high. And then finally, um, the cost of production state to state is not something we did a deep dive into. It's a little bit hard to get that level of data to be able to compare. Um, but in the future, that is something that we could, given a longer time frame, potentially look into. Yeah, thank you, Jill. Uh, Bob Gray, uh, did you have your hand up? Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, uh, members of the committee, both committees. I very much appreciate the opportunity to, I wanted to wait a little bit, uh, uh, Bobby, before I made any comments, because I wanted to hear what the rest of you were saying. I, I'd like to extend my thanks to the commissioner and to Jill for your report. It was very, very well done and very comprehensive. Good presentation, Jill. And would you kindly send me a copy of it? I'll get my email to you. I'd like to see it. Absolutely. Uh, I, I want to be a little bit, uh, sort of go back a little bit of history. I don't want to take too much time, but I, I work out of DC uh, and I've worked out of here for a number of years. I used to represent seven dairy co-ops back in the uh, early 90s. Now it's down to three, Dairy Farmers of America, uh, uh, Agrimark, and Upstate Niagara over in Western New York. They're down in Pennsylvania now, but I used to have seven. You can see what's happened within the in the uh, dairy cooperatives in terms of consolidation over the years. I live in Northern Virginia. I'm 20 minutes from the capital, but I do legislative work and regulatory work for the dairy co-ops. Uh, but what I what I want to talk about is is three or four things, and I'll try to go through this pretty quickly. And if you have any questions, <laughs> I'll be glad to answer them. First of all, uh, in terms of the federal milk marketing orders. Uh, uh, there's always been an effort to, uh, to really criticize them, and uh, it, it's sort of an easy thing to do, but the federal milk marketing orders are just part of our whole pricing process. There is an effort underway right now to look at the class one price mover after we've seen the uh, producer price differential problems uh, that occurred with that that were changed in the 2018 Farm Bill when the class one price mover was changed from the higher of class three or class four, the differential was changed and they went to an average uh, and added tacked on 74 cents on the class one differential. They're relooking at that and they're relooking at the class one price mover. What I would say about the federal milk marketing order price, there has been 
sort of reviews of that over the years. It is complicated. I don't consider myself an expert on federal milk marketing orders because I don't work on that per se. I work on immigration reform. I'm working on climate change. I work on uh, the dairy margin uh, uh, coverage uh, program and other things as well. The federal milk marketing orders are a very special uh, issue. Uh, now, we've had a number of, of, uh, of uh, times when they have been looked at. I'll, I'll talk about just a few years ago when there was some interest in trying to look at a competitive price, uh, uh, milk pricing under the federal orders where you would select certain counties in the country where there was a very competitive price for milk. And uh, there was a lot of interest at that time of saying that might be an answer to improving the price for uh, uh, milk. And as they looked at that and examined that, they found statistically that wasn't going to work. And geographically, it didn't, uh, it didn't uh, really do the job. So what I'm saying about federal orders, if you're gonna change the federal orders, you've got to really examine how, how it's going to work out, what's going to come out at, at the other end of the pipe, or you may get something that's going to make things worse. Now, I agree that class one, uh, our class one uh, utilization has gone south. In the Northeast, it used to be 45%. It's now down to 29%. Uh, and uh, uh, there is uh, uh, taking uh, uh, National Milk and others are taking a look at the class one price mover. Some people say, well, we ought to have a class one differential for all four prices. Class two, which are uh, uh, soft products, cottage cheese, ice cream, and so forth. Class three, the hard cheeses. Class four, uh, uh, butter and powder. But if you're going to change the federal milk marketing orders, number one, you better do a very good analysis and that better be done by people who know what they're doing. And the joke always used to be there were only three people in the United States that knew anything about federal orders, and they were ordered never to get on the same plane at the same time. But uh, what I'm saying is you need to have the industry pretty much behind this. You're going to make suggestions to the uh, USDA's uh, marketing service. You need to have the industry behind this, and there is work being done on that right now, and there will continue to be work. Now, let me just say just a couple other things. I don't want to dominate this uh, session because it's very good and I've learned a lot by, by listening. In 2014, we had a, a, a milk price of $25 a hundredweight. What we saw after that was a 3% to 4% overproduction across the country starting in 2015, 2016, 2017. Farm milk prices went south in a hurry. Some of the cooperatives, including Agrimark, of course, and DFA and others started to institute supply management procedures. Not all of them did. There's about 20, uh, 35 to 40 cooperatives. They produce about 70% of the milk in the country. There is 30% of the milk is produced by independent producers. Keep that in mind. Many of these are huge. They have 15, 20,000 cows. Now, they would love to see the 35 co-ops have a strict supply management program so they could put out another 5,000 cows and keep overproducing, okay? Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't do more supply management with our cooperatives, but you gotta keep in mind, a lot of the $210 billion, uh, billion pounds of milk produced in the United States is not necessarily produced by cooperatives. And, if, you, if you're looking at, uh, somebody mentioned this, I think Jill mentioned this, and she made a very good point, that the transportation cost of milk is very expensive. DFA sends a lot of its milk into the uh, uh, southern states because they are milk, milk deficient. Uh, I have friends of mine in Florida say, my God, Bob, we pay $7 a gallon for a gallon of milk. Uh, Bobby was mentioning $3, uh, $2.95, $3 for a gallon. The reason is that milk is is brought all the way along from Texas and other states all the way into Florida and Georgia and states that are producing very milk, uh, are very milk deficient. So that's what our, what, that's the environment out there. The other thing I would say is this, uh, uh, as working down here and working on all the kinds of legislation, we're gonna see more 
legislation here on climate change, which we, we are looking for renewable energy. Uh, I'm very high on trying to get uh, greenhouse gas emissions and more anaerobic digesters and efforts by our dairy farms to use methane gas and have it converted to electricity. And uh, uh, there was an ERS study by the Economic Research Service a, a few years ago that showed as much as eight to 9% of our uh, electricity in the United States uh, could be used to, uh, to generate uh, electricity in our country. Bill Rowell, who's on, uh, I think uh, has enough electricity on his operation to uh, provide 500 homes. Now that's what we should be doing. And uh, uh, so the other thing is this, we've got a number of environmental groups and I don't criticize them because I work with them all the time, but we are, we are facing a number of groups down here, activist groups who think that the agriculture, the livestock industry should be reducing our dairy herds, our, our hog operations and so forth because we make a larger contribution to greenhouse gas emissions. That's not necessarily true but we need to work on technology and so forth so that we can reduce greenhouse gas emissions even more. Uh, uh, the, the cost of anaerobic digesters are very expensive and uh, they don't cash flow for a number of years. So those are just some of the things I wanted to add to our discussion. And lastly, I wanna say something about Dan Smith. I, I appreciate uh, uh, Bobby Starr's comments about the compact, but Dan Smith had an awful lot to do more than I did about the compact and it worked very well. But I would just say this, there are a number of things that deal with farm milk prices. When we get over, when we get a high price, we get overproduction. We tried to get in 2014, a supply management provision into the 2014 farm bill, along with the dairy margin coverage program. Uh, I know Jackie Folsom uh, worked with us on that, the Farmers Union and other groups. We got killed on the House floor by a loss of over 100 votes in pulling that piece of supply management out of our, uh, out of our bill. And it's very tough. I'm not trying to apologize, but it's very tough to get a supply management provision done federally. We can try, but I tell you, it's not easy to do. So those are sort of the things that we're working on. I want to work with everybody and we want to keep our small farms in business and, and also keep in mind that every piece of legislation we have passed, including the MILC program that Senator Leahy put together in 2002, the dairy margin coverage program that was passed as part of the 2014 farm bill uh, is a risk management insurance program. Every one of those has a component in it that's directed to smaller farms. It has a, it has a cap in it that is directed to help smaller farms. The problem is it isn't enough. And now many people are saying we should have always had a program. And I've, I've said this for a number of years, we always should have had programs at the federal, uh, at the federal level that were more directed to help our smaller and mid-sized farms. Now we're trying to do more of that, and I think there'll be more efforts in the 2023 Farm Bill to do that. So thank you for giving me an opportunity to make some comments, uh, Chairman Starr. Next up is Kerry Thompson Atherton, followed by Jane Clifford, Larry Gervais, and Leon Berthium. Kerry. Sure, Chair, you're muted. Um, I just wanted to add to the what the subsidy part on for the Vermont. It was way back in the beginning. Eventually, that's going to fall right back on the back of the farmer. So I don't know if, if subsidizing is really the the route to go. Um, it's going to fall back on us either tax paying or services or um, supplies. It's just going to fall back on our backs, as far as the farmer is concerned. Yeah. Um any Jane, Jane Clifford. Jane Clifford is next. Thank you. Um, first of all, I want to thank both um, the committees for for all the work, but especially um, DFR for their um, 
very in-depth study in a very short period of time with all of the other work you're doing with the COVID-19. So um, thank you for that because um, I'm, I'm sure it's not easy. Um, first of all, I wanna go back to Henry Pearl's question um, about what, what are we trying to do here? Are we trying to look at a price of milk or are we trying to uh, save farms? I, I think that that is a key to moving forward and recognizing what is it that we want. Um, if we look at the information that Diane Bothfeld sent us all this morning, um, we see that there has been significant attrition in, in farms. But if you look at milk production and cow numbers, um, we've become much more efficient and yes, we've consolidated. But as Commissioner Pichak mentioned earlier also, what industry has not consolidated? Um, I think we have to be realistic in moving forward with dairy farming and looking at it's a business and we need to know the cost of production. I don't want 26, 27, 28 dollar milk because as Bob Gray indicated, that just brings overproduction and then we have the downturn. And again, if you look at Diane's numbers in 2014, yes, we had 23, $24 milk. Back down to 2015, it was $16. On our farm, I can, I can get away with 1750 milk. I don't wanna do it for very long. I can do it for a year or two, but I can get away with it because my cost of production is in line with that. Every farm has a different cost of production. So to create a milk price that helps everybody, in my mind, it's, it's going to be very challenging. I think the other piece that we have to, to realize is, and I think Jackie Folsom mentioned it very in, in the beginning, it's all farms are, are farms that we need. Pushing organic, pushing grazing. I, our farm has been in production continuous dairy production since the early 1800s. We are sustainable. We've weathered the ups and downs and we will continue to do that. So I, I think we have to be careful when we look at farming. We want our farms to be sustainable business going forward. And I want to kind of reiterate what Bob Gray indicated is you have to be careful for what you wish because it might come true. Yes, milk marketing order is complicated and it's not perfect, but it provides a program that is transparent and is audited and everyone knows. When we start moving away from that, what do we get? I, I'm very proud of being a DFA member um, and I think sometimes we get conflicted with because it's big, it, it, but it's also created in regions. And we talked about moving milk. As Bob indicated, moving milk is very expensive. We don't move milk into Vermont. We have a Northeast region of milk and the milk is utilized in, in Vermont. To move milk from Ohio, Michigan into Vermont, that cost is, is prohibitive. We have plenty of milk here in this region. We're not moving milk. I think the other piece that I just want to kind of bring us back to is dairy is a business. And if you're looking at moving forward, as it's been indicated by many people, helping farmers become better business people and really understanding the cost of production will be key in moving forward. Again, I wanna thank everybody for all the work that has been done over the years on this. Um, and I just have to say, I like it on the other side, not being a lobbyist, but being a producer. Yeah, Larry, thank you. Sorry, Larry Gervais. Good morning, Larry. Good morning, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> uh, so I'm gonna to have to go to another meeting shortly, so I'm not gonna be able to hear all this. I apologize. I thank you 
for uh, having us here today. Uh, and I wanted to put uh, guys like Bob Gray and Leon Bertha on up front to talk a little bit more about you know what is going on nationwide with the supply if with the supply management theory because we see with you know Agrimark actually started doing this before the COVID and then we were forced with DFA because we I used to be St. Thomas Co-op which is not around anymore but the last um, I don't have the figures in front of me but the last uh, milk uh, report came out and you know Vermont did end up reducing, I think, 5% or whatever. But the check wasn't put across the whole nation. And you got a state like Texas, I went up 10%. So it kind of hurts us over here because we don't know this program that's in front of us. is It's not voluntarily, it's put on us. And now we don't know what next month's uh, mailbox price is going to be on that last for us, it's 13%. It used to be 15%. Uh, and you can't run a business like that. I mean, you look at September, October, you're like, oh, it looks like it's going good. You're not getting deducted too much. It was, I don't know, maybe three, four dollars. And then you get to the December one, it was ten dollars. Well, I guess my question to, to Bob would be on a the federal, I mean, we know this has to be something done in federal to and it has to be an all in buy-in to, to make this work is is there a way that is being presented that it's more uh, uh, voluntary if you had a percentage on a year that we got an oversupply here's the price of milk that's we're going to pay you if you drop your production to here a higher value added you can still produce your whole base in that last five percent ten percent whatever it is maybe at a lower value but then anybody that produces over their base, it has to be something checked in there where, you know, you know now you have an impact fee or something like that. Uh, is there something like that? Because if it's voluntary, it's a lot easier to do for different farms. And it may work for some, may not work for others. But if it's, a, you, you know, set the bar at a 15%, you get a 5%. Hey, that might be enough to offset. Maybe it's just a 2% uh, overproduction in the country and then that corrects the, the milk price. And, and we know, uh, you know, we are now at a disadvantage here in the Northeast. It used to be an advantage to have the uh, class one fluid milk, uh, you know, over 50%. And that's the way we were modeled that. And we can chuck our milk to all these markets. And we never built that infrastructure over here but they did out west for different avenues to condense it down and all the, the dairies are right there at those plants. It makes it a lot cheaper for transportation wise. And, you know, melt fluid doesn't actually probably come to east, but other products do. So if there's, you know, the Northeast compact was great. You know, it was a region and, and it kind of put a check and balance and things, but it has to be a, a total buy-in. So I'm just wondering uh, if you could answer a little bit of that question. I'm, kind of getting a little long-winded and I know a lot of other people want to talk and I do have to leave and apologize, but that's just basically what I have to say. Yeah, thank thank you, Larry. I think Leon's, isn't Leon up pretty soon? He's next. Yeah. So welcome, Leon and uh, <clears throat> Leon Berthium from uh, DFA. You're muted, Leon. <laughs> Again, good morning, and thank you for the invitation to participate uh, this morning. But first of all, thank you to all the committee members for your continued advocacy for Vermont agriculture. Um, I certainly want to commend the commissioner and Jill and the department for a well-researched um, and comprehensive report as well. I certainly appreciate the objectivity and the insights that were provided in, in this report. I think there's been a lot of great comments that have been made uh, throughout this morning. And so some might be a little repetitive, but again, I think as the commissioner started off, our dairy industry along with many other industries have evolved. When you think about our farmers, we need to give farmers credit for how they have adapted and adopted to so many changes um, in their operations over their history, if you will, with increased technology today and precision farming has also changed again how they operate. 
at the same time, our industry became more from a regional to a national and today a real global um, industry. And so we need to recognize that as we talk about our solutions. And as been noted, you know, Jill has mentioned that, you know, Vermont is a little bit different in terms of where it sits. Um, the size of Vermont and our population also probably limits us in terms of what we can do to really generate, you know, some additional revenues to have really a significant impact in adding to, you know, our farm farmers income. You know, dairy pricing has been a topic over my 37 years, you know, with the cooperatives and supply and demand continues to be the primary market forces um, really for impacting overall farm prices. Um, and that's really where we need to get to the heart of if we're really gonna have any significant impact is that. But at the same time right now, even under these circumstances as a country and as Larry had just mentioned, you know, we're still seeing year over year increases in overall milk production. You know, recently, you know, on average, the 24 states are over 3% again. And today we have the highest um, or the largest herd um, on record since 1998. And then we continue to see milk per cow continue to grow. So those are all things that, again, continue to challenge us um, when we're looking at what's uh, and how that's impacting our overall milk price. Um, again, it was noted, you know, again, in terms of the loss of farms, and it's already been alluded to, there's other reasons than economics that farms sell herds. There isn't that sometimes, again, no next generation. Uh, workforce challenges has been an issue in hearing from our farmers in terms of creating challenges for farms, um, as well as the increasing demands that we are asking on our farmers. Um, there's more requir uh, reporting requirements, more documentation that's required on our farms, a lot more administration um, and adherence to new practices that also have you know, impacted as to whether or not, again, that farm wants to continue to move in that direction. Um, as well as the farm, we gotta talk about the processing side and consolidation and changes in ownership of processing plants and manufacturing plants certainly has had its impact as well, especially when we look at New England where the majority of Vermont's milk you know, flows. And we really haven't seen a lot of new investments um, from you know, processors, manufacturers, other than what dairy farmers um, uh, have owned and invested in their own facilities. When you think about recent years, that's where the majority of the investments have been um, is with the cooperatives and the dairy farmers at their own facilities. We need to work with all of our processors, regardless of the size, but as importantly, we need to really work with our larger processors um, to support and grow their operations here in Vermont so that they can continue to, again, uh, utilize more of our own milk. Um, and so we got to make sure whether it's um, our commissioners, our agencies have really close relationships with these larger processors um, in the state. And we need them um, again. Uh, and I think they are challenged because many of them are owned by global companies, have plants across this country and so our local plants have to compete um, for investment dollars. And so we've got to make sure our business environment is conducive um, for continued investments here um, in their facilities to utilize more milk. Um, again, um, our, as I think Jane most recently just talked a little bit about, you know, our dairy farmers need to become more familiar with their financials, their cost of production, also, again, as, as brought up by Jill this morning, the risk management programs, we really don't have, a, again, enough utilization of the risk management programs that are offered either by the government or the cooperatives. And so we need to continue to focus on increased education and support for these particular programs. Again, investment, whether it's in UVM extension or other resources, we really need the expertise and cutting edge professionals um, to support our farm operations um, here. Um, just a, again, a couple of more brief comments in terms of te technology and innovation. I think um, this is an area that we need to continue to focus our energy and resources um, as we need to continue to look at new product lines, uh, new ways of again, utilizing uh, dairy. Um, base excess program supply management. Again, I'm not sure that I would use those as uh, again, synonymously. Um, you know, base excess programs really provide an economic signal um, to the, uh, again, the dairy farmers in terms of what's going on in the marketplace. 
but dairy farmers at the end of the day can determine to what extent they wish to produce milk. Um, the program just allow, allocates the costs more equitably in marketing the additional milk over the base. So again, I think the other thing is we got to work with our congressional delegation and this new administration to see where their priorities. We already know that, again, one of the key focuses is going to be the climate change agenda. And I think we need to understand how that's going to impact our industry here in Vermont and what are we going to need to do to support our dairy farmers to meet what those new expectations might be. So I know as, a, again, a member of the DFA team, you know, and others that are with me um, today, you know, we're certainly interested in taking part in any actions, you know, as we move forward from today's hearing. So thank you for the opportunity. <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Leon. Uh, are there Ron, others? Uh, yes, Mary White. Yeah, good morning, Mary. Good morning. <laughs> So I just want to thank um, everyone for being here and the people that worked on this report. I think it does a really good job at actually identifying some of the price issues that we're seeing. And we keep talking about operating farms as a business and having people understand that concept, which is huge, but it's so difficult to do in such a volatile market when it comes to your gross farm income, because again, milk is our number one product on these dairy farms. And even with risk management programs, it's really hard with the volatility we've been seeing over the last five years as to know, you know, am I going to be able to make these investments I want to make next month, next year? So there are definitely issues um, with pricing. And I think uh, Larry mentioned that being the volatility point as well with the base excess programs. Um, definitely on the co-op level, I don't think we're seeing that return in our milk check. So it has to be a national program when we talk about supply management. We were able through Farm Bureau to actually present the Vermont Milk Commission report on a national level, and it received a lot of positive impact. So everyone that worked on that, um, again, COVID kind of put the brakes on that, but we were talking to producers and organizations from California and all states in between that were very supportive of the work that we did here in Vermont uh, for putting that on a national scale. So, on the same point as that, Jane mentioned this, is if we see an increase in price and we trigger that overproduction again, that's not gonna help the industry at all. So I think a lot of these things go hand in hand when we talk about the FF MMOs with the pricing and doing supply management at the same time. How do we get these systems to work together to be able to support all producers um, that really wanna have a good price and a standard market for our milk. So I will say that we use risk management programs um, in abundance here on our farm or a small farm, uh, definitely under the cap. So we've got DMC, DRP, and due to feed prices, um, you, you know, this year our DMC did not pay out like we predicted. So there's other markets that impact these risk management programs other than just the milk price. Um, DRP is a great tool, but again, we're not seeing that return um, in our milk check prices when we lose some of those due to other market volatility that we cannot control. So this is a price issue. Um, and I think that we really need to do some more research on why farmers are going out of business. And I think advancing technology and getting people to understand their business is huge, but we need to understand the pricing market going forward and how to adapt with consumers. <clears throat> Yeah, thank you, Mary. Hey, a quick question, Mary. Um, are you the one that lives on the right side of the hill or the left wrong side of the hill? <laughs> I'm on the wrong side. Oh, you're on the wrong side of the hill. Hey, uh, getting back to milk pricing and all that, if, if we hadn't have had COVID money that we helped with this year uh, on the, in the, Farmers, how, how would that have turned out financially for farmers that you work with if there had been zero dollars instead of what got paid out to our, our dairy farmers? Through, through the state program? Yes. So it was, um, it was a mixed batch, you know, because people had, some people applied for the federal money and some people hadn't. Um, I think overall it was, 
it was huge. You know, our lowest mailbox uh, milk check price was down at $13 during COVID, which is very much below our cost of production. And I know some DFA farmers that we work with were receiving $10. So on top of that, with cuts um, in production, it, it was definitely well received and needed. I don't think anyone got ahead from it by any means, but it was definitely helpful um, just to have some state input. So we do thank you for that. Yeah, thank you, Mary. Um, Representative Partridge would like to speak. Yeah, Carolyn. Carolyn, are you with us? She's working on it. Sorry, Bobby, the uh, space bar is not working to unmute. Uh, I, I want to, um, I'm going to have to jump off this meeting to go to the Agricultural Affairs Capital Grants uh, Committee meeting. Uh, but I just wanted to take a very brief moment to thank everybody for coming today. Uh, and I especially want to thank the uh, commissioner and Jill Rickard for doing this report. I think it's it's really helpful. Um, and and uh, and and thank you especially to the farmers because um, I think you guys do the hardest work of almost anybody in the state. And uh, sometimes you're not paid. In fact, a lot of the time you're not paid uh, what you should be. So. Um, Thank you all, and um, I'm sorry I have to leave, but I want to make sure the fairs get their money. So take good care, and thanks, Bobby. Yeah, thank you, Carolyn. Yeah. Um, Steve Kehart has been waiting. He's got his hand up. Yeah. Let's see. Steve? Steve, are you there? Yeah, I see you. You're on mute, Steve. Uh, good morning, and I guess close to good afternoon now. Uh, Can you get closer to your mic? Is that better? Uh, yeah, some. Can you hear me now okay? Yeah. Okay. I want to thank you for the invitation to participate in this and, and be a listener. Um, you know, I, the commissioner and Jill, I think it's a wonderful report you did um, and shed some really good information. Uh, I'm a dairy farmer, uh, second generation here on our farm. I've been here for um, pushing 30 years at this point. Um, I guess my comments that I would have uh, after listening to this, uh, you know, everything always the focus is on price. And I think back to uh, a couple comments have been made about 2014 in 2014, I had probably the most fun farming that I've had in my life. Uh, <laughs> everything was super, super easy, and you couldn't figure out where to invest the money that you had. And my dad told me at the time that it was probably going to be a really bad thing for our industry. And I would say the following four or five years that followed that proved that to be very, very true. Yeah. Um, you know, because of the prolonged price slumps that we've we've been sitting in. Uh, not saying that the price, you know, would I personally like to see $20 in my own checkbook to, to pay the bills? I would, but I'm fearful on the larger scale of what that does to incentivize uh, overproduction, which we've seen time and time again. Um, we were, I'm an Agrimark member, and of course we were affected by the base uh, cutbacks this year. And I've become a student of milk pricing and risk management because I've had to, uh, to help make our business uh, be able to compete with our competitors in other states in the Midwest, far West. Um, you know, I think, some of the things that the state can do is really work to help educate uh, the farm community uh, about the different tools that are there. Um, I was on a webinar yesterday and I believe uh, they said that only 7% of the production in Vermont is covered by DRP contracts. 
uh, for this year at this point. And, you know, that's one of the tools that farmers can use uh, to really kind of protect themselves to the swings of the market. Um, but there needs to be the, you know, the education there so that people understand it and understand how it works. Um, I guess a couple other real quick comments, uh, you know, farms that have kind of gone out of the business. One of my biggest fears is that we're seeing kind of a changing of the landscape in Vermont. Uh, we've had two of our neighbors within the last month that went out of business. One that was a farm of about 250 cows and the other that was a farm of about 100. Those farms went out of business because their base was produced, or excuse me, base was uh, purchased by other farms that wanted to have the ability to market and sell more milk. And it was an avenue for them to get out of the business and to receive a good price for their cows. The sad part to me is, is there will probably never be cows on those two parcels of land again. And I'm a little fearful with what that's going to do to, you know, kind of the landscape in Vermont. Um, you know, I, I would challenge the legislature that I hope that's where a lot of the efforts are is and what sort of things can we do uh, to to support the farm, not necessarily in trying to raise the price, but trying to help keep their cost of production uh, lower. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think that goes a long ways. Other things that are kind of key in mind, and I think I heard one person kind of speak on it a little bit, uh, is workforce challenges. Um, we've seen state of New York uh, now with the minimum wage, it's increasing in overtime uh, legislation and, and rules. And, you know, that's caused their labor costs to go up tremendously. And we can feel that's already coming, you know, that's coming down the, the road in Vermont as well. And going to be another challenge that we need to deal with. Um, I guess that's really it. I just, the, the big thing for me is, uh, you know, trying to, to manage or manipulate the price of milk, uh, I think is gonna be a really hard thing to do um, because we're dealing with a nationwide thing, uh, you know, and the, the independent producers that are not affected by these programs, uh, you know, kind of have free reign. So thank you for the opportunity to speak. Yeah, thank you, Steve, and say hello to your dad, Lee. I will. Senator, we have two people left on the list, Catherine Durand and Rob Wheeler. Yeah, uh, Catherine, you're, you're up. All right, great. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, good afternoon to everyone. I appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak with all of you. Um, I'm the best Vice President of Economics and Legislative Affairs at Agrimark. Um, so as you all know, our 160 farmers in Vermont, uh, two plants, 680 of my colleagues, uh, we love talking about dairy sustainability. This is really important. And I'm just so thankful that we had the opportunity to, to work with the commissioner and, and Jill as they were drafting their report, which I've got to say I was really impressed with. Um, it's a difficult issue to tackle and I, I was just impressed by the, the thoroughness of, of that report. And I think what I appreciated most was the acknowledgement that long-term sustainability of dairy farming is equally weighted on milk price and on the cost situation. And we tend to think about the milk price and I apologize, I, I came in a little bit late to this meeting. So I'm probably reiterating what has already been communicated here today. Um, but you know, milk price is the number one fix we all seem to gravitate towards for obvious reasons. But the challenge is that it is a national system. Um, and from that standpoint, um, that's where you know, we feel we need to be targeting our approaches um, and, and spending much of our time. And I just want to you know, just update the group and, and let everyone know that we are integrally involved 
in conversations surrounding milk pricing. Um, you know, it's, it's clear to all of us, especially the farmers in the room, that there are some significant issues with our current system. Um, and even more that have unfolded in this last year with the pandemic situation have really showed us um, where there are some holes and, and what holes need to be filled. And I'm just honored uh, and thankful that Agrimark, as well as our other co-op partners, have a seat at those tables where those conversations are taking place um, in the economic policy committee arena um, and really looking at making a ch making changes that we all, I think, agree to. Um, we are, you know, right in the midst of all of those as we speak. Um, and so hopefully um, we'll be coming out with some great recommendations in the, the not too far future. And really just uh, appreciate the support of everyone in Vermont um, to, you know, come to some agreements together and, and support us in those efforts. I also just want folks to know that it's not just looking at what are these immediate issues in front of us, um, but also taking, you know, that 50,000 foot level. Um, and so I appreciate, you know, the state DFR looking at it from that way um, at, in a national arena, we're also doing that. And I think that's really important. Um, you know, a couple other things I would say on the revenue side, you know, some of these state programs that were referenced in the DR, uh, DFR report, um, you know, are great models that are worth exploring. Um, you know, they can be extremely beneficial if they are structured appropriately. And if the state is willing to um, support, support those efforts, um, I would caution that we need to be careful that we are adopting a program that um, does not put Vermont farmers at a competitive disadvantage and also make sure that that flow of milk continues in an appropriate way. Um, I'll piggyback on a comment that Steve just made and that you know, there always will be risk in dairy markets, no matter you know, if we get every change we're looking for and then some, there's always gonna be risk. And that importance of risk management is going to be continuously um, and, and more so you know, just critical to the success of our dairy farms. And I think there's some ways that we can you know, look to other states and what they've done to support their farmers in, in getting into risk management, whether that's um, educational resources or perhaps a little financial incentive, you know, paying for a premium to get into some of these programs, things along those lines. Um, I think there's some great uh, opportunities there. And lastly, on revenue, I would just say that you know, Vermont has been so supportive in acknowledging and supporting farmers on those, uh, you know, non-federal order pricing revenue streams, you know, supportive of uh, value added, off-farm on-farm processing, all these different things. I think um, you've done a great job and should continue to do. Where I kind of take a step back and, and what I mentioned, I appreciate about this DFR report is is the focus they had on cost, and I think that looking at the cost side of the equation for profitability is where there are some huge opportunities for the state to really be a leader um, and do some great things and, and help out not only our farms, but our communities um, and our environment. And, you know, we as a dairy industry and dairy farms, we talk about cost of production as, um, you know, kind of a ever increasing burden on our farms, right? And it is, we talk about labor, um, all these things that we ask farms to do because we know that they can do that for us. But I think we should be kind of shifting our narrative a little bit and thinking, you know, what are cost of productions for our local economies? You know, those costs come right out of our farmer's milk check and flow into our local communities. So, you know, I think we need to start thinking about cost as really this ever increasing economic contribution to our local communities. And, you know, I get a little excited that if we can shift that focus, um, we can do some really great things together. And again, support our farms, but also our local communities and, you know, continue to foster that economic growth. Um, you know, I think we encourage, embrace and support uh, the adoption of efficiency measures, technology on farms, um, you know, we're, we have the new administration now with a focus on climate change. Um, farmers have a huge opportunity to help in that fight. And I think Vermont is showing that we can be a leader in that. And if we can pull our farmers into that conversation um, and into that solution, I think we can do some really great things together.
Um, and uh, I will end, I apologize, I was a little long winded there, but I um, want to end with my favorite part of, of the report that came out was the mention from Julie Murray Bickford, who's with the Maine Dairy Industry Association. And, you know, I'm not um, supporting or, or against the Maine program, but more so what she quote, what was quoted, she said about their state program. And she referred to their program as uh, a true economic investment in their rural economy. And that really spoke to me. And I, I think that's where we're at in Vermont. We need to be, you know, making the decision. Are we, are we willing and ready to make that investment, not just in our farmers, but our entire, you know, local communities and economies that our dairy farms are so integral in. So um, we're at a really exciting time and I think we can all do a lot of great things together. So again, thank you to DFR for doing such a great um, job on that, that thorough report and for all of you for all of your feedback and, and support in, in helping out all of our farmers uh, and our state. So thank you. Yeah, um, Catherine, a quick question if I may. <clears throat> Why don't you tell us what it, a fair price uh, should be for cost of production. And yeah, you know, should it be, should it cost you $15? Should it be $16? Should it be $20? Because we have nothing to judge that by because every farm is different. But what, what do you as a company executive feel is a fair and reasonable uh, cost of production. And if we had that number, I'm sure we could work up or we could work down as, as a group to, to more than meet that. Well, I, I think that's a bit of a loaded question. And I guess I would come back and say it, it would depend on what are those goals of economic contributions that you're, you're looking to achieve, right? Um, you know, one of the interesting things we see about um, cost of production data is that it's, it's very correlated with milk price, right? And so we see that cost of productions will, will follow our milk price. And if our farmers have more money coming in, if their margins are better, they're going to spend more. They're going to do better practices, better farm management, make it better and better. So we could go as high as you want. We could do some really great things. Um, if you're asking what sort of a general cost of production is, I think, you know, it varies greatly amongst farmers, um, but some of, you know, whether you're looking at USDA or some other cost of production resources, you know, average, we would say in the region is about $18. Yeah, and we aren't even anywhere near that. And, you know, that's why when Steve Kahart testified, he had such a smile on his face back there when the price was good because he could go down the street and buy what he wanted to buy, not just what he could afford to buy. But anyways, we'll, we'll get to that uh, eventually. Uh, so we have one more witness, uh, Linda. Yes, Rob Wheeler. Sorry, oh. folks, I'm, I'm, I know in the interest of time, you want to move along and, and I'm a retread I'm on now for the second time, but uh, I, I forgive me for not noticing this, but I'd like to ask the commissioner and uh, Jill, did, did you look at Massachusetts state program? I know you mentioned Maine's and I know that Jill was intimately involved, not Jill, excuse me, Catherine was intimately involved when she worked for the state of Massachusetts uh, on their program. Um, I have a, just a little bit of anecdotal knowledge because I am so close to the Massachusetts border where I farm here in Vermont. Um, and uh, it's interesting to me that I've watched my Massachusetts neighbors uh, be able to plow money that the state of Massachusetts has given them back into their operations. They're buying robots, they're modernizing um, small farms like myself. They're able to plow that money back into their farms. And, uh, um, and that's all based off uh, 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 Mr. Chairman, that's all based off a cost of production study that I believe happens every year. And uh, of those Massachusetts dairy farmers, they're actually asked to participate in a cost of production study. And from that study, they determine uh, what that cost of production is. And then if the milk price is below that for any given month, then they qualify those farms, all those farms qualify for uh, that Massachusetts payment that's given to them 
um, on a per hundred weight bit, uh, basis. Um, and I'm just wondering if the, if the uh, department looked into that program at all. Uh, Jill or, or Commissioner, are you still with us? I'm, I'm here, <clears throat> Senator. Yeah, unfortunately, we did not look into the Massachusetts program. I, if given a longer time frame, I would have loved to look into every state program and to the European system and to what New Zealand's doing into all of these things. I could have written 100 more pages, but unfortunately, we had a limited time, so I had to sort of pick and choose. <laughs> Well, you did very well with the time that you had. <clears throat> um, well, it is afternoon and uh, well, we have Bill Rell. You have a question, Bill, or a statement? Yes, hi, thanks everyone. Uh, good discussion. Haven't heard anything about the export market and surplus milk as a result of losing export. So if you have a management tool in play and you have pressure from, let's say the upper Midwest, let's call it that we are making 216, 17 billion pounds of milk a year and we have a 17% export market. If you lose a percent or two of that, that's gonna create a surplus of milk. And if the management tool is imposed on a certain region, but not another, there's nothing to keep that milk from flooding in on top of you. And when there's enough milk on the market, it will move if the price is right. And it's surprising how far it will move. That's something that I'd like to uh, bring to your attention and, and uh, something that you should keep in mind because some years back, the state of Wisconsin spent a lot of money and quite a few years building infrastructure to process their dairy products. We don't have the infrastructure to process all of our milk. And if somebody can flood milk in on top of our effort for less of an expense than we can produce it here, it will show up. I say that because I know that it does. Just would like to bring that to everyone's attention. Well, I think that that is one area that I don't know, uh, Jill, uh, if you or Michael, but I think that's one area we didn't get into uh, too much. Um, and but it, as we move forward, uh, hopefully we'll. <clears throat> We'll form a task force that um, that can move forward. Uh, that's part of the of the bill, and uh, we'll have you know people on there and review um, review that bill along with other suggestions that um, that people today have put forth, as well as what's in our report from from the commissioner. Sure. Um, with that, um, I think is if that we've covered everybody, I think, uh, and it's been uh, very good. Everybody has been quite timely because uh, we're just 14 minutes over um, or, or 15. Um, so in closing, again, I'd, I'd like to thank all of you for your time. Uh, that you spent with us and a special thanks to <clears throat> Commissioner Pishak and, and Jill for the work that uh, they did so diligently and, um, and I'd say complete. Um, and for spending, uh, especially the commissioner for spending most of the morning with us uh, with so much on his plate uh, these days um, and yeah, you know, Commissioner, uh, thanks a lot for all you've done in regards to the COVID issue uh, statewide for all of us. Um, you and your team of, uh, with the governor have done an excellent job. And um, I, uh, when I can, I watch you guys on, on TV and, and 
the, the way you guys present yourselves so calm and collective is, is really good. Um, so thanks a lot for all that. And um, I'm sure uh, we'll, uh, we'll have more to do to, uh, to work together into the future and uh, appreciate all you've done. So thank you and thank you everyone else.